So if you've come here to hear me read my Inktober Chronicle story, I'm guessing that you've already been following my other videos about Inktober. But just in case you've come across this video by chance and you don't know what this is about, I'll put some information in the description below. So this is going to be quite a long video. So make yourself comfortable, get a cup of tea or coffee or, or whatever you whatever you want. Um, I've got my cup of tea and um, this particular one was a gift from an Irish friend and this phrase apparently means what's the story which I thought was particularly appropriate. <laughs> so in this story each chapter represents a different day of October so I will put the dates up on the screen so you can kind of follow if that helps and also I'll put an image of my sketches which are relevant to the chapters that I'm reading. However if you've already seen my sketches and you don't really want to just sit and listen to me read feel free to treat this video like a an audiobook or a podcast if you want to just listen to it in the background while you're you know, catching up with laundry or washing the dishes or, or whatever. I won't be offended if you don't just sit and watch the top of my head <laughs> as I've got my head down reading. <laughs> so if you're sitting comfortably or if you're getting on with other jobs, I'll just have a quick sip of my tea and then we'll make a start. Okay, Inktober Chronicles. Prologue. September had been busy, too busy for Laura's liking. She'd been looking forward to a quiet month in October, but now it had finally arrived and she looked at the next few weeks in her diary. Apart from a few appointments, the diary was empty. Now, a quiet month didn't seem so relaxing after all. It just seemed dull. She knew she'd have to find a project to occupy herself. This time last year, she'd gone on a sketching holiday, but last year she'd still had a job. Laura had been out of work for five months now. She'd done a few odd jobs here and there, and she'd done a couple of training courses, but there was still no sign of a permanent job yet. She didn't dare use her savings to go on holiday this year, because who knows how long she'd have to make her savings last. Her eyes wandered around the room as she tried to come up with a plan. Nothing sparked any inspiration. With a heavy sigh, she decided to try going for a little walk to see if the fresh air would help her think more clearly. Chapter One, Backpack. Getting ready to go for a walk, Laura opened the big cupboard where she kept her coat and there, hanging on a hook on the back of the door, was her old backpack. Immediately, she knew what she would do. She knew she couldn't afford to go away for a holiday this year, but that didn't mean she couldn't make her own adventures right here. She was determined to do something each day that was different from her usual routine. Of course, she'd have to stick to a low budget, but the backpack was ideal for that. She could take a packed lunch with her and a flask of hot tea so that she wouldn't be tempted to visit every cafe that she saw. She would take a small sketching kit with her too. That would be the perfect way to preserve the memories of this cheap but hopefully fun month. During her walk, she thought about some cheap places that she could visit and then when she got home that evening, she sat down with a cup of tea and did her first sketch, the backpack. Chapter two, discover. Laura had lived in the same town for almost all of her life. Yesterday, she'd thought about some nice places that she could visit nearby for free. But what she really wanted was new adventures, places she'd never been before. After breakfast, she headed into the town centre to visit the Tourist Information Centre. It was only a small place. It wasn't a town that attracted many tourists. Laura had walked past this place hundreds of times, barely even noticing that it was there. 
She'd never thought to go into the tourist place in her own hometown before. The elderly lady behind the counter was very friendly and asked if Laura needed any help. She resisted the temptation to say, I'm okay, just browsing, thanks. Instead, she explained that she lived locally and didn't have much money, but wanted to visit some local places that she'd never been before. The lady directed Laura to a display in the back corner of the cramped room where there was a display of local attractions. Some places had expensive admission fees and some were actually miles away from town. But by the time Laura left, she was feeling satisfied with her bundle of leaflets and photocopied maps. Chapter three, Boots. There was something about planning her adventures that made Laura think about dusting off her old boots. It was unlikely that she'd actually be walking on any terrain that really needed proper hiking boots. Her walking shoes would be perfectly adequate, but nevertheless, she hunted down her boots. She eventually found them lurking in the bottom corner of her wardrobe. She didn't notice them the first time she looked because they were in a plastic bag. She'd expected them to be dusty and maybe even a spider or two in residence, but she was shocked to see the reason she'd stored them in a bag was because she hadn't bothered to clean them the last time she'd worn them. How many years ago was that? With a sigh, despairing at her own laziness, she took the boots outside the back door and started the process of cleaning off the old mud. Chapter four, exotic. Laura had big plans for the next day. She was going to put her newly cleaned boots to use and go for a long trek. However, the weather had different plans for her. Under normal circumstances, she enjoyed a walk in the rain but the rain today was torrential and it would definitely not be fun to go for a long walk. The first line of her favourite novel repeatedly popped into her head. There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. Laura was disappointed. It was day four already and so far all she'd done was prepare for adventures but she felt like she still hadn't actually done anything. She had a quick look through the leaflets that she'd picked up at the Tourist Information Centre to see what she might be able to do that was fun but undercover. Yes, this place would be perfect. Unfortunately, it would use up a chunk of her budget to get in, but that couldn't be helped. Near the motorway junction, the other side of town was Butterfly World. She had been there before, but that was many years ago. The place had grown since she was last there and now included a farm park and a small zoo. Laura reasoned that the exotic butterflies and other creatures would all be different now, so it would be as if she was going to a new place. It was very busy. It seemed she wasn't alone in looking for a dry place to visit on this rainy day. Despite being a bit crowded, she enjoyed every minute she spent there and took so many photos of the exotic creatures and an equal number of photos of the less exotic animals. It was hard to just pick a few favourites to sketch after she got home. Chapter five, binoculars. The 5th of October was another wet day. Another day of not being able to go for the trek she wanted to do. After the bustle and excitement of the previous day, she felt like having a quieter adventure today, but she really wanted to avoid spending more money. What could she do? Pondering what to do on another wet day, she looked again at the photos she'd taken the day before. While she was looking at the photos she'd taken of the birds in the aviary, she remembered that a local nature reserve had a bird hide that looked out over the lake and marshy area. She'd had a peek into the bird hide before, but she'd never really taken the time to just sit and watch out of the open windows. The hut was only a fairly short walk from the car park, so she didn't get too wet. She was glad of the opportunity to use the binoculars. They always seemed like a good idea, but she almost never took them on walks because it was just another thing to carry. 
However, sitting quietly in the bird hide with a sketchbook, a flask of tea and the binoculars was great. The hide was draftier than she'd expected, but with her big winter coat and her hot tea, she was pretty cosy. Fortunately, the wind was blowing the rain away from the open windows, so she was able to rest her sketchbook on the ledge without it getting wet. She loved having the opportunity to sketch on location instead of just using photos later. She didn't see many birds, just a few hardy ducks and one heron still fishing in the rain. But that was okay. She enjoyed the peace and solitude anyway. Chapter 6. Trek. The next day, Laura was pleased to see the sun shine in. The day was cold but bright. Perfect weather for a long trek that she'd planned. She was thankful that she'd have the boots to protect her ankles if it was very slippery after all the rain. According to the map, this walk should take approximately six and a half hours. But she knew from experience that it always took her longer than the estimated times for mapped walks, especially when hills were involved. This particular trek was a circular walk which would take her past two Iron Age hill forts and also two white horses that had been carved into the chalk hillsides. These two horses had both been carved during the Victorian era, although there were others in the county that were much older. This was a much longer and much hillier walk than she had tackled for a long time. She really enjoyed the first half of the walk but the rest was just too much. At one point, the route took her across a road. She was very tempted to just sit on the grass verge and to call a taxi, but she persevered and kept going. As predicted, it took her longer than the printed time estimate. By the time she got back to her car, it had been about eight hours. She was exhausted and her legs were really aching. She had taken lots of photos, thinking that she would sketch when she got home. She was too tired to even sketch that evening, but she wanted to have a reminder of her achievement, so she made a copy of the map in her sketchbook. Chapter 7. Passport. When Laura woke up the next morning, she could barely get out of bed. Her legs were so sore from yesterday's trek up and down all those hills. Today needed to be a quiet day at home. Even though she was going to have a restful day, she still wanted to do something that was somehow connected with her mini adventures and making this month a kind of travel experience without going far from home. An idea popped into her head to make a sketchbook that looked like a passport to document her travels. Of course, she'd already done some sketches in her normal sketchbook, but that wasn't a problem. She could just cut the pages out and glue them into her passport. Since she was a child, she'd always loved making things and was in her element with paper, scissors and glue. Not much had really changed and bookbinding was one of her favorite hobbies. The only difficulty was finding a good enough image which she could use to make the cover because she didn't have a real passport that she could copy from. Chapter 8. Hike. On the 8th of October, Laura was still aching from her trek, but it wasn't so bad today. She wondered if another walk might actually loosen up the stiff muscles a bit. She picked out a hiking map that included a local park, which she knew fairly well, but the park was only a small section of the route. It was mostly alongside little country lanes and through a small village. The route was almost totally flat and it had definite paths to follow, which sounded quite appealing after the trek, which had included lots of muddy fields and slightly ambiguous directions at times. This walk was technically classed as a circular route, but it was actually more like a figure of eight which was also appealing because if Laura had enough halfway through the walk, there was an easier shortcut back to the starting point. 
So once more, Laura filled up her backpack with food and drinks and headed out for a lovely autumnal walk. She took it slow and enjoyed the views. When she got home, she even had energy left over to clean her boots, which she hadn't cleaned after the long trek. Chapter 9. Sun. Laura had a job interview in the morning. It seemed to go pretty well, but she'd just have to wait and see. In the afternoon, she met up with an old friend who she hadn't seen for ages. They didn't do anything special. They just sat drinking tea and chatting and having a real good laugh. It was lovely. They suddenly noticed that the afternoon had slipped away and it was already getting dark. Laura said she'd better head home and think about what to cook for dinner, but her friend suggested that the two of them go out for a pub meal. They ended up at the Sun Inn and had a lovely meal. After dinner, they got a couple of hot drinks and settled into the comfy sofas in the pub to continue their chat. That didn't last long because they hadn't realised it was quiz night. There was no chance of them continuing their quiet chat the quiz master had a microphone and he was too loud to ignore. Laura and her friend ended up joining in with the quiz. They hardly got any of the answers right, but they had a fun evening anyway. Chapter 10. Nomadic. The next day, Laura was visiting another friend. There would be no pub quiz today. The plan was to stay in the warm at her friend's house and spend some time doing some crafts together while they had catch up. Her friend lived in one of the villages outside the town and as she passed the village green, Laura was thrilled to see a traditional gypsy caravan and horse. In the town, almost every green space was surrounded by low walls or posts to stop modern travellers setting up camp. On the rare occasions when she saw a traditional caravan, Laura always wondered if they lived a nomadic life all year around. When she was a teenager, she'd bought a book which was the life story of a lady who'd grown up in a travelling family in Scotland. Laura still had the book, a cheap paperback with very yellow pages now. In her story, the lady said about how the family would rent a house during the winter, but they hated it and longed to be travelling again in the spring. Seeing the caravan today and being reminded about that old book, Laura knew she'd be rereading it again soon. As for the afternoon she'd planned to spend doing crafts with her friend, her crochet project stayed in its bag and they spent the whole afternoon just chatting. It was not the first time and she was sure it wouldn't be the last. Chapter 11 snacks. This was turning out to be a very social week for Laura. On Friday she'd been invited to a little party. Everyone who was going would be taking a plate or bowl of something to add to the buffet. She was notoriously bad in the kitchen so she'd bought a big bag of nice crisps to take. She wanted to try and make something herself but felt she needed to have a backup plan just in case the cooking went badly. She decided to make some roasted crunchy chickpea snacks. She'd made them in the past and they'd gone well, but other times she'd tried and it had ended badly. She had no idea what she'd done differently. That was how it always was in Laura's kitchen. Sometimes success, sometimes failure, but she never really knew why. She was very happy to see that the chickpeas were crunchy, but not burnt. She split the batch into two bowls and flavoured half with spicy paprika and the other half with brown sugar and cinnamon. Of course, other friends would have made much more impressive contributions to the buffet, but she was happy to have something to take. Plus, she had the added bonus of having a nice big bag of crisps to eat at the weekend. Chapter 12, Remote. Laura was surprised to receive an email from the company who she'd had an interview with just a few days before. They were inviting her back for a second interview on Monday. She tried not to get her hopes up, but
that this was the most promising news she'd had on the job front so far. She knew that this was mainly a remote job, so she'd be working from home, if she got the job, and would only be going into the office occasionally for training and team meetings. She didn't know yet if the company would be supplying a desk or if she would need to use her own desk in her craft room. Oh dear, her craft room was a mess. Thinking about the possibility of it becoming her workspace too, she felt motivated to go and have a tidy up and declutter. It was a bit daunting to know where to start, but after the desk area was all clear, she felt really good. Even if she didn't get this job, it felt good to have reclaimed the desk space and she decided to update her budget at the desk instead of sitting on the sofa with her laptop on a tray like she normally did. Now all she had to do was get through the second interview. Of course the other half of her craft room was still chaos but that could wait for another day. Chapter 13 Horizon Usually Laura spent Sundays with her parents and her mum would cook a roast dinner. She hadn't seen them last Sunday because that had been the first dry day when she'd been able to go on the long trek. Today, she took them out for a drive in the countryside. There was no real plan for the day, but they stopped to explore a few of the quaint villages that they drove through and she treated them to tea and cake in an old fashioned tea room. They explored a couple of antique shops and Laura even bought a couple of cheap items to use in a craft project that she'd been planning for a long time. Later, they ended up stopping at a pub for an early dinner and Laura's dad insisted on paying. Laura was secretly grateful because the menu was pricier than what she'd expected. The food was lovely though. Driving back home, they timed it beautifully, coming down a hill towards the town as the sun was setting over the horizon and highlighting the town's skyline. It had been a while since Laura had seen the town from this perspective. Chapter 14 Rome After spending so much time with other people last week, and especially with the stress of her second interview this morning, Laura had felt the need for a bit of quiet time alone. She spent a lot of time alone anyway, but there was something different about making a deliberate decision to go and do something alone, instead of just being alone at home. She decided to spend the afternoon at a National Trust property. She went to a place that was only a 20 minute drive away. She had been there once before, but she had done a tour of the house on that occasion and hadn't seen much of the grounds. It was a nice bright day, so it was a perfect day for having a roam around the big estate surrounding the house and enjoying the autumnal colours. She moved away from the formal gardens near the house and wandered down a wide grassy avenue. After a while, she came to a wooded area and she couldn't resist going to roam among the trees. She loved the colours at this time of year and already there was the start of a yellow leaf carpet on the ground. She always loved walking through autumn leaves. On dry, bright days like this, it was her favourite time of year. She felt herself relaxing after the stressful morning, and gradually she stopped worrying about whether she'd said the right things at the interview or not. Chapter 15, Guidebook. Laura had been a member of the National Trust for several years, but she had not made much use of her membership this year. After her pleasant afternoon the previous day, she thought she would try and get a few more visits in before the weather turned too cold and many of the sites closed for the winter. She settled herself on the sofa with a cup of tea and her guidebook to search for properties that were a reasonable travelling distance from home. She was mainly looking for places she hadn't been before, but there were also some, like yesterday, where she had been in the house, but not the grounds, or vice versa. It was often easier to plan visits by using the app, 
but sometimes she still liked to get the book out. One of the things she liked to do with the book was to go to the alphabetical index at the back and highlight the names of new places that she visited. Each year when she got a new guidebook she'd transfer all the highlighted places into the new book so that it was a complete record of the places she'd visited. For the first couple of years she had even tried to mark them in a different way if she went back more than once but that got too complicated. One of the places that she was interested in seemed to already be closed for the winter but she managed to find three or four places that she'd like to visit soon. Chapter 16. Grungy. The next day the weather was terrible again so Laura put her National Trust plans on hold. Instead she decided to tackle a grungy job that she'd been procrastinating about for months. It was time to do some decluttering in the garage. At one end of the garage were two metal racks. She was hoping to be able to declutter enough to be able to get rid of the shorter rack. In the past, Laura had owned a classic car. Deep down, she knew she would probably never buy another classic car. There was no logical reason to keep hold of the tools, but it was still too hard to let them all go. She knew it was silly, but she couldn't help it. In the end, she shuffled tools around between various toolboxes so that all her imperial size spanners and sockets were all together in one box. Maybe that would make it easier to let them go next time. Although she hadn't managed to let go of the car tools, she did manage to let go of some other tools which she had too many of. Also, she was able to declutter lots of bits of old wood and empty tins that she'd previously kept because they might be useful one day. After a little bit of reorganising, she managed to get everything to fit onto the tall rack. Then, with a little too much satisfaction and nostalgia, she looked down at her hands, which were so grungy and oily from handling all the tools, it looked like she'd been working on her old car again. Chapter 17, Journal. The next day, no rain was forecast, so she headed off to a National Trust property. She had never been to this one before and was excited to explore a new place. It was further from home than she'd intended to travel this month, but she had all day and she set off quite early to make a full day of it. First, she did a tour of the house and afterwards she had a look in the gift shop. She saw a really lovely hardbound journal with a William Morris design on the cover. She stopped for several minutes debating with herself whether to buy it or not. In the end, she realised that it was stupid to spend money on a book when she enjoyed making books herself. She left the shop empty handed and then went for a cup of tea and a slice of cake in the cafe, which was in the old stable buildings. Afterwards, she went for a wander around the beautiful gardens. At the end of her visit, when she headed back to the car park, she had to pass the shop again. She went in and had another look at the book. It had been a few years since she'd kept a proper journal, and seeing this beautiful book made her want to do it again. She told herself she couldn't afford to waste the money when she could make something similar herself. But then she also told herself that even bakers sometimes buy cakes instead of always making their own. In the end, her heart won the battle and she bought the overpriced but beautiful book to use as a journal for the next year. Chapter 18, Drive. It was cold today and that reminded Laura that she'd been wanting to make a new skirt for the winter. A few years ago, she had made a long summery skirt and she wanted to do the same design again, but with some heavyweight material. She imagined a tartan type of fabric with muted colors and maybe she'd even film the process for her YouTube channel. 
Although it was a fairly basic design, it was one that she had made without using a commercial pattern. First, she drove to her local craft shop, but unfortunately, most of the fabric they had was lightweight cotton, or it was bright colours which she didn't like. From there, she drove to a nearby town, but the fabric shop there was mostly bridal fabrics. She remembered a shop that she'd stumbled across by accident last year. Unfortunately, it was in a town about an hour away, which seemed a long way to drive just to go to one shop, but she couldn't find what she wanted locally. It was worth it. The shop was even more amazing than she remembered. It didn't look very big from outside, but inside there was room after room after room stacked with every kind of fabric imaginable. In the end, she bought two lots of material, one with the muted tartan pattern that she'd imagined, and one that was a plain neutral colour that would go with anything. Chapter 19, Ridge. After several easy going days, Laura thought it was time to get the walking boots out again. When she went for a long trek earlier in the month, she'd started out her walk on part of the Ridgeway and she thought it would be nice to see a bit more of it today. Of course, she had no intention of ever walking all of it. She read that the Ridgeway was 87 miles long. It was a prehistoric route which started at Avebury and ended in Buckinghamshire. On her earlier walk, she'd seen two white horses from Victorian times, so today she thought she'd visit a much older one. The white horse at Uffington was the oldest in Britain, believed to be from the Bronze Age or Iron Age. From Laura's point of view, it had the advantage of having a car park nearby, so it was a fairly short but steep walk to get to it. Also, just a mile along the ridge was Wayland Smithy. It was named after Wayland, the Saxon god of metalwork, although it was actually a Neolithic long barrow tomb and not a blacksmith's at all. But Laura liked the idea of it being a smithy so close to the white horse. Chapter 20, Uncharted. Yesterday's walk had not been long in terms of miles, but it had involved some steep climbs and uneven surfaces, so Laura was aching today. She decided to go for another drive. Today she fancied just driving without a destination in mind, just see where she would end up. After a while she found herself on a road which she had driven many times before, so on a whim she turned off the main road and onto a narrow track to see where it would lead. Out of the corner of her eye, she briefly saw a sign which warned that this track was unsuitable for heavy vehicles. But her car was small and light, so she wasn't worried. It soon became obvious that a big, heavy vehicle had driven up here while the ground was wet and soft but now the ground had hardened again, leaving huge ruts. Unfortunately, she hit one of the high spots and her car was grounded. She was well and truly stranded with her back wheels up in the air. She called her breakdown recovery company, but of course she was on an uncharted road, so it was hard to describe exactly where she was. So she walked back down to the main road to keep a lookout for the recovery vehicle. When she got to the bottom, she saw that she had misread the warning sign and it actually said, unsuitable for motor vehicles. She had a long, cold wait for the recovery and felt very stupid and embarrassed about her mistake. She was certainly very glad to eventually get home after that adventure. Chapter 21, Rhinoceros. Due to the unexpected adventure the previous day, Laura didn't get time to visit her parents, so she visited them on Monday instead. They had a nice relaxed afternoon, drinking tea, chatting about the previous week, and watching a bit of telly. 
one of the things they watched was The Repair Shop. It was an episode which had been filmed several years ago, but surprisingly it was one they hadn't seen before. In this episode, a lady brought in a big leather rhinoceros named Ralph. The seam had come undone at his bottom and his tail had fallen out. He had lots of tiny flaps of leather sticking out on one side of his body where he had been scratched by a cat. His eyes were loose and he had a saggy belly that needed some extra stuffing. Susie, the leather expert, and one of the other ladies were giggling like little schoolgirls about adding extra stuffing through the open seam at Ralph's bottom. Poor Ralph, it was most undignified. In the end, Ralph was stuffed and stitched back up and he had his tail put back in place. And even his cat scratches were healed using watered down glue. Another member of the repair team helped with his eyes using a technique for tightening sofa buttons. The lady was thrilled to see Ralph looking like new when she came to pick him up. Of course there were tears because Ralph had been a gift from her late mother. And of course there were tears for Laura too because she always got emotional when she saw other people getting emotional. Chapter 22 Camp In recent years Laura had been doing her grocery shopping online to save time and it also saved her money because it helped avoid impulse buying. However this week she had left it too late to put in her order so she ended up roaming the aisles with a shopping trolley. She tried to stick to the shopping list but as expected she did pick up a few extras. Mostly her willpower failed her in the biscuits and crisps aisles but there was one surprising item that made its way into her trolley. Maybe it was the general feeling of trying to be adventurous this month or maybe it was just because it had been a while since she'd walked around a supermarket but she ended up buying a bottle of camp coffee. She had never tried it before and she had no idea if she would like it but decided to give it a try. She wasn't even a big fan of normal coffee, so she made a very weak drink for herself. At first she thought she liked it, but then she wasn't so sure about the aftertaste, and she was glad she hadn't made it strong. She saw that it was also used in baking, but considering her lack of confidence in the kitchen, that could wait for another day. One bad taste was enough for today. Chapter 23, Rust. It was very cold and wet on this day, so Laura decided to stay at home and spend a cosy day working on some of her hobbies. She spent the morning working on her current lace making project. When she stopped for lunch, she started watching some old videos on her favorite YouTube channel. On one of the videos, the lady showed how to make fake rust. She started with some cardstock in the shape of a book plate and she dabbed black and brown paint onto it, plus a couple of brighter colours in smaller amounts. Then when the paint was almost dry, she sprinkled it with cinnamon and added a coat of Mod Podge. The final step was using a heat gun so that the surface bubbled up. The cinnamon looked like rust and the bits of paint showing through looked like the remains of paint that had flaked off due to the rust. She also showed an amazing and ornate escutcheon for a keyhole. Laura had seen this video a few times in the past and had always intended to give it a go. Having rusty accessories to glue onto the front of her handmade books would be fun, especially if it was an antique looking book with tea dyed pages. After the discipline of the lace making in the morning, she was ready for a little bit of a messier project and was very pleased with the end result. Chapter 24 Expedition During her travels this month, Laura had spotted a sign which she hadn't noticed before. The sign was for a footpath leading to her favourite local park. She packed up a small bag with art supplies and a bottle of water and set off on an expedition to find a new route to the park and hopefully do some sketching along the way too. 
At the start of her expedition, she had to fight her way through some overgrown brambles. If it had been further along in the journey, she would have thought she'd taken a wrong turn, but it was so close to the footpath sign, there was no mistake about the direction. She was actually quite pleased about the brambles because it meant it wasn't a path that many had trodden before her, not recently at least. Beyond the brambles, the space opened up into a grassy area. This was also very overgrown, but she could make out part of a gravel path beneath her feet. She followed the semi-hidden path until it disappeared completely. After that, she kept heading in the same general direction until she came to a barrier. She turned to walk alongside the barrier, believing this must be the footpath. Soon she came to a wide path which looked new. This gave her confidence that she was going the right way and she thought she was close to the destination. But unfortunately, it only led her into the back of a building site where new houses were being built. She did not find a new route to the park and she didn't even do any sketching. Feeling quite deflated about her failed expedition, she headed back home. Chapter 25, Scarecrow. Laura gathered together the leaflets she'd picked up at the start of the month. One of the things she had brought home was a booklet of top attractions in the county. Looking through it, Laura was drawn to the centre pages featuring a safari park. There was a list of dates for special events and she noticed that this month they had a scarecrow trail in addition to the usual animal attractions. She looked up the admission prices on their website and was shocked to see that it was over £40 for a ticket. Well, that was the end of that idea. After the money she'd already spent this month, she definitely couldn't afford that. Instead, she settled for looking at the maps and photos on the website and hoping that one day she would be able to justify spending £40 for a day out. She enjoyed looking at all the animal photos Plus, it was nice to see that the Scarecrow Trail was a fun and friendly one, and not a scary one, despite being October when most places were decorating for Halloween. Chapter 26. Camera. It was another grim day with the weather. Laura hadn't picked the best month to do lots of outdoor adventures, but it was nice to spend some time at home too. Today she wanted to do some paper marbling using Sumanagashi inks to use as end papers and for the cover of her next bookbinding project. She had only done it once or twice before but she decided that she would also record the process to share on her YouTube channel. Unfortunately, when she got her camera out, it would not turn on. She put it on charge assuming it was just a flat battery but something more serious was wrong with it and it would not work at all. She could perhaps film it on her mobile phone, but last time she tried that, the focus kept going in and out. She obviously couldn't afford to go and buy a new camera at the moment. So she put a message on a group chat to see if any of her friends had a camera that they would be willing to lend to her. One of her friends kindly brought a camera over and they did some marbling together, which was great fun, as her friend had never even heard of Suminagashi before. She didn't want to be in the video though, so Laura was careful to only film her own work. She assured her friend that she would delete the audio of them chatting and would do a voiceover for her video when she edited it later. Chapter 27, Road. Laura was feeling a bit under the weather today She'd had a bad night's sleep and was really tired. She was lounging around in her pyjamas and dressing gown, feeling a bit sorry for herself. And she knew she needed to do something to boost her mood. It had been a really long time since she had watched any of her DVDs. Nowadays, it was just so easy to watch films and TV programmes online. But she felt the need of some old familiar films to cheer herself up. One of her favourites, which always put a smile on her face 
and made her want to get up and dance was American Graffiti. She loved the music and she loved the cars. It always made her feel good. In reality, it was mostly just a bunch of teenagers driving around the roads of their town at night and listening to Wolfman Jack on the radio. A rivalry between two drivers about who is the best ends with the famous race and the crash near the end of the film out on Paradise Road. Laura felt so much more energised after watching this old film. It worked every time. Chapter 28 Jumbo After a good night's sleep, Laura was feeling like herself again today and she met up with another one of her friends. They didn't have any particular plans apart from just to spend the day together. They were reminiscing about some of the things they used to do when they were teenagers and that led on to talking about the best films that they had seen at the cinema. Neither of them had been for a really long time so they decided to go. This was one of the days when the cinema does cheaper tickets to encourage more people to go. So maybe they could even afford to get some sweets or a hot dog too, just like the old days. They looked online to see what films were showing, but unfortunately there was nothing that either of them wanted to go and watch. Laura was actually more disappointed about missing an opportunity to get a hot dog. Now that the idea was in her head, she really wanted one. In the end, they drove to the cinema and bought two of the jumbo sized hot dogs. They figured if they weren't paying to watch a film they could have the jumbo hot dogs instead of the standard size. After enjoying the nostalgic hot dogs they did a bit of window shopping and then went back to Laura's house to chat and drink tea all afternoon. Chapter 29 Navigator Laura's dad had bought something on eBay which needed to be collected. Laura agreed to drive him. It seemed only fair, especially considering he'd given her his car when his eyesight got too bad to drive anymore. Driving down the road with her dad, it felt like the days when they used to go to classic car shows together. She missed those days. She also remembered further back to times when she had been little on holiday with her family. She remembered sometimes sitting in the front passenger seat while her dad drove and her mum was relegated to the back seat, Laura had been the navigator and it was her job to help out with directions from the big road map resting on her lap. Although looking back, she wasn't sure how helpful she'd actually been, but at the time it had made her feel important and useful. Nowadays, the only navigator in the car was Google Maps on her mobile phone. Chapter 30. Violin. It was time to look at the leaflets again. Today Laura decided to visit a place she'd never been before. In fact she'd never even heard of it. In a nearby town there were several museums, including a free museum with thousands of musical instruments. Laura liked the look of many instruments, although she had never been particularly musical herself. Some years ago, she had tried to learn to play the double bass. She still owned it, but it was basically just a huge ornament now. She was surprised that there was only one double bass in the museum, but they did have a lovely collection of violins. Her favourite thing about looking at violins was the tiny bridges, which looked like doll's house versions of the giant bridge on her bass. One particular violin caught her attention. It was quite battered compared to the others, but that's not surprising considering that it had been made in 1641. It was believed to be the oldest violin made in England, although it was actually made by a German violin maker called Jacob Raymond. Chapter 31 Landmark On the last day of the month, Laura decided to go to her favourite local park. She had intended to go there earlier in the month when she tried and failed to find a new walking route there. Maybe she'd be able to find the way by tackling it from the other end. It seemed like a sensible plan until she was there. 
There were several side paths that she could have taken, but she was not sure which one to try. Previously, she'd got lost when following a marked path, so she wasn't confident that she'd be able to find the route from an unmarked path. So she walked the well-worn path around the lake instead. It was a lovely sunny day and she enjoyed the stunning autumnal colours. When she got back to the starting point, she got a cup of tea from the little cafe and sat on a bench to sketch the diving board. It was definitely a well-loved local landmark. The current concrete Art Deco structure was built in 1935. Although swimming had not been allowed in the lake since the late 50s, it had recently been restored at great expense. Epilogue. Despite some bad weather and a few failed efforts, and even some embarrassing moments, Laura had enjoyed her month of mini adventures. She was surprised when she added up the total cost of all her little spends here and there on things like tea and cake. On the whole though, she'd been sensible about doing low cost activities and taking food and drink with her for the bigger days out. The expensive journal that she had bought would last all of the following year and the winter skirts which she planned to make with the new fabric would hopefully last her for many years. She would be starting her new job towards the end of November, so she had a few weeks for catching up with all the mundane jobs at home that she had been avoiding during October. As she reflected back on the month and looked at all of her ink sketches in her little passport sketchbook, she thought that she would always remember her October 2024 adventures as her Inktober Chronicles. The End so, if you made it to the end, thank you. It's been a long one. <laughs> I'm on my second cup of tea. <laughs> I was pausing to take little sips between chapters, but um, I will edit that out. So thanks again for watching or listening, if you've been doing other stuff while listening to the story. I hope it didn't send you to sleep. I quite, I quite pleased with my little story, but you know, it's not, it's not the most exciting story in the world, is it? So thanks again for watching or listening, and uh, I shall see you again soon.